Welcome to The Appleseed, where we bring you and your family great stories from great storytellers. On today's episode, we'll bring you a sliver of intrigue. We have an elaborate system of hiding behind parked cars with secret signals and all sorts of sophisticated maneuvers. And a slew of secrets. This work was top secret. We could tell no one. I'm your host, Sam Payne, and today our stories are all top secret, full of classified operatives, covert friendships, and undercover feelings. We'll start with Israeli storyteller Noah Baum with a story called Top Secret, recorded live in the Appleseed studio. When I was a little girl growing up in Jerusalem, Israel, we didn't have TV, we didn't watch movies, but we didn't need to. You see, we had movies up here in our head all the time. We read books. We didn't own many books. They were expensive. My mother didn't believe in spending money on books that were not encyclopedias. No, one borrowed books from the library or swapped them with friends, as in, coming to swap books? Hey, can I come over and swap books with you today? I want to come over and swap books. If someone is your friend, you swap books. And like all the Jewish Israeli kids in Israel in the early 60s, I was a devout groupie of a particular series of books, Chasamba. It's an acronym. Chavuat Sod Muchlat Bechlet. Quite impossible to translate, but I'll try. The Secret Society of Absolute Total Secret. <laughs> They were a secret society of eight boys and two girls. They had a secret hideout caves in the cliffs overlooking the sea, full of technological wonders, just like uh, Batman's, the Batcave. Their commander was the fearless and handsome Yaron Zehavi. Second in command, Tamal Hayafa, Tamal the Beautiful. She had a long, thick braid. So did I. And they were inseparable, and anyone reading those books wanted them to get married when they grew up. And in book 38 or 40, they did. <laughs> oh, Hasamba, they were my heroes. They uncovered international conspiracies. They caught Russian spies. They fought the Arabs and the cruel British mandate. But most of all, time and time again, they saved the entire nation of Israel from its worst enemy, the despicable gangster Elimelech Zolkin. <laughs> How can I translate that? Imagine pure evil, like the Joker in Batman. And his name, Irvin Schmockenfarb. <laughs> Eli Melech Zorkin. <laughs> oh, those books, they were filled with heroes and enemies. But they were in the books. They were not al emet. They were not for real until fourth grade. Fourth grade arrives. And I, Noah, the shortest kid in the entire class suddenly have enemies. Boys. <laughs> Do you remember those days? When boys who were perfectly normal humans suddenly morph overnight into nose-picking, hair-pulling aliens? <laughs> I have no idea how or why that happens. But all of a sudden, in fourth grade, the boys become them. And we don't play together anymore, except one game, tag. And we have two versions. Habanim al-habanot, boys on the girls, we, they chase us. Habanot al-habanim, girls on the boys, we chase them. They grab our skirts and pull our hair. We tackle them and push them to the ground. We shriek and holler. It's brutal. 
They are the enemy. <laughs> But then there's pure evil. Boaz Malchi and Yuval Stendel. Boaz, thinner than a pine needle. His best friend Yuval, freckled face, shortest boy in the class, only a hair taller than me. I'm the shortest, you remember. And it started at recess. I, I wasn't playing Habanima Labanot. I was just standing there. Boaz comes and pulls my braid. Hey, I'm not playing. So stop. Catch me if you can. Well, I start chasing him, but there's Yuval right behind me, pulling my braid. I'm not playing. So catch me if you can. And I don't stand a chance. He may be the shortest, but he's the fastest runner in the school. And they, they chase me after school, singing. No, a motorcycle riding to the movies. Apparently the only two words in the Hebrew language that rhyme with my name. <laughs> I come home in tears and I say to my mother, nobody likes me, all the boys hate me. My mother, who is known to throw a fit if you spill milk on the counter or forget to flush the toilet, when presented with my earth-shattering, tragic suffering, is not even impressed. Of course, if it's not the war, the Nazis, or the hunger, what could possibly be so bad in my childhood? <laughs> She's smiling. Stuyot. What nonsense. Who told you such a silly thing? They're pulling my braid all the time. Oh, no, Ali. I'll tell you a secret. When boys pull your braid like this, it's a sign they like you. <laughs> I'm speechless. <laughs> The only logical explanation is that aliens have abducted my mother's brain. She has become stupider than boys. <laughs> I'm forced to take matters into my own hands. I make sure I stay very close to all the girls on the way home from school. When I'm with a gaggle of girls, Boaz and Yuval don't dare come close enough to pull my braid. But one day, I go out into the schoolyard, and the girls didn't wait for me. And I hear, Hey, no, no! My enemies. Boaz. Yuval. My heart starts pounding. I decide I'm just going to ignore them and go home fast. Hey, no, no, wait up! But I'm already on the other side of the street, past the cypress trees in the corner. I am running. I know what they're going to do if I wait up. They're going to pull my braid. The book bag is bouncing against my back, the braid swishing from side to side. I can see the corner of our street right there. We are the second house down the slope. On the left, I can see the lamppost at the entrance to the path leading to our building. It's not far. I just need to get there. But my legs are so heavy. Even my braid feels heavy. It's like I'm slogging through a swamp. If only this was Chassamba. I would be faster than the wind like Tamal. I would be fearless like Yaron Zehavi. But this is not a movie in my head. It's Al Emet, for real. And they're closing in on me. I'm running down the slope of our street. Yuval is so close, his breath like a dragon's flame scorching my back. I'm at the lamppost at the entrance to the path leading to our building. And snap. Something snaps inside me and I stop. It's like a force I never even knew existed takes over and screams in my head, I know I'm going to die, but I'm just not going to run anymore. And I twirl to face my enemy, and I scream into his face, What do you want? His face is sweaty and red, his eyes bright green. Want to swap books? <laughs> What? Can I come up and swap books with you? With me? Yeah. Now? Yeah. What about Boaz? 
Buzz is standing at the top of the street. Yuval calls out to him, but he just glares. Yuval shrugs. You have chasamba and the horse thieves? No, but I have chasamba in the claws of Florent and the cyclop. Okay. He follows me down the path and up the stairs to our second floor apartment. And from that moment, Boaz stops talking to Yuval. When Yuval and I uh, arrived together at the class hangout evening, Friday night under the carob tree in the park, uh, this is long before helicopter parents. <laughs> this is when 42, 42 classmate kids in fourth grade gather every Friday afternoon under the carob tree without a single adult in sight to sing and dance and play games and talk. But that Friday, when Yuval and I arrive, Boaz is leading the singing in our face. <laughs> Impossible to translate. <laughs> but I'll try. The tune is, is the Israeli national anthem. And the words? In the middle of the night, when the stars come out, no, I knew Val are getting married. <laughs> Everyone is singing. Yuval is blushing. I turn bright red. Everyone's laughing. Guess it's not easy being the first couple of the fourth grade <laughs> at the age of Habanim al Habanot, us versus them. We're ostracized. We turn around and walk away. He says, We don't care, right? Right. And we decide we're not going to go to class hangout evenings anymore, even though I am the class cultural committee. <laughs> and we are very careful not to be seen together in public so that when we walk from his house to mine, we have an elaborate system of hiding behind parked cars with secret signals and all sorts of sophisticated maneuvers. And we create our very own top secret society. <laughs> He's the commander. I am the second in command and the nurse. I'm in charge of our first aid kit with uh, bandages, gauze, uh, cotton balls, and iodine. We write our code of honor in invisible ink made of lemon juice. We pledge secrecy and loyalty till death. We spend hours on our bellies in our hideaway cave made of blankets fastened with clothespins to the balcony rails. We spy with his father's binoculars on Gittel the witch. <laughs> That's the old woman who walks in the middle of the street talking to herself in Yiddish. But we will prove that she is a secret German spy. We swap books between our secret hideout caves every day. It's better than Yaron Zehavi and Tamar. It's better than any Hasamba adventure ever written. And it's not even a movie in our head. It's Al Emmet. It's for real. We are the movie. It's the best. <laughs> At the end of fourth grade, I got a haircut. No more long braid. Soon after, my family went to America for my father's sabbatical at Stanford University for two years. And when I returned in seventh grade, it was no longer habanim al habanot with the boys, but um, dancing and phone calls. And I, I wish I could tell you what that was like, but I wasn't one of those girls. I met Yuval in the hallway, still only a hair taller than me. I said, hi, Yuval. He blushed, turned his head, and ran away without a word. And I took it in with all that perfect logic of seventh grade. 
of course he doesn't want to talk to me because I'm so ugly. None of the boys want to dance with me anyway. And it was just stupid swapping books and secret gangs. And it was just not a limit. It wasn't for real anyway. And we didn't exchange a word all through high school. And we never saw each other after that. But you know how you can carry that teenage self with you no matter how old you get? I allowed that seventh grade logic rule for so many years. I let it erase everything that happened before like invisible ink on a page. But then I became a storyteller. Someone who gathers clues from memory's secret hideouts to create stories. And the images resurfaced, like, like invisible ink held to a candle flame. Two fourth graders, sweaty-faced boy, long-braided girl, facing each other beneath the lamp post, hiding behind parked cars, peering from blanket caves on balconies. And suddenly... I became obsessed. I I realized we had not exchanged a word in 44 years. That's a really long time. Did it only happen to me? Was it real? I googled his email. But hesitated for many weeks. Will he remember? Will he respond? All I could see was that seventh grade face turning away. Oh, but he answered right away. And the technological wonders. Here we were, two middle-aged people with families on our own, talking across the ocean from America to Israel on Skype. (laughs) Oh, it's impossible to translate. But I'll try. He said, Boy, am I glad you had the courage to close the circle. I really loved you in fourth grade. Too bad I lost all my confidence in those high school years. I didn't know how to hold on to that wonderful friend with the long braid. Hey, I asked, do you remember our secret society? Not much, he said, spying on Gittel the Witch from the balcony. I mainly remember what I felt. I really loved you in fourth grade. And at that age, we paid a price for breaking the taboo of us versus them. But I didn't care. I remember feeling like the king of the world that day you invited me up to swap the books. Hey, we were pretty brave when we were little, weren't we? And I said, yes, I think we were heroes. And you know, for weeks, I couldn't erase this ridiculous grin from my face. Because <laughs> it was real, you see? It was real. I'll aim it. Thank you. Noah Baum with Top Secret. You never know what's going to bring on a memory, and you never know what memory it's going to bring on. Thinking of Noah Baum's love of those books when she was a kid put me right back in elementary school when every Tuesday afternoon, the bookmobile would stop at the city park. The whole inside of a bus covered in bookshelves and those bookshelves filled with books that we could check out just like from our school library. And we would head over there on our way home from school. We'd save our lunch money on those days or maybe had a couple of dimes in our pockets from returning soda bottles. And we'd stop by the candy store on the way to the park. And then our mouths filled with cherry sours, we'd walk up the stairs of the bookmobile, grab books from the shelves and read. And in those days, I wanted to read nothing more than the Edgar Rice Burroughs books about Tarzan, Lord of the Jungle. I never could have brought those books home. My parents thought the covers were a little too much, many of them with fair maidens clutched in the arms of roaring gorillas or encircled in the coils of pythons. So instead of checking the books out, I'd sit on the floor of the bookmobile and read until I had to go home. And that's why I've read about one chapter of just about every Tarzan book. I don't know how any of them end, but I know how a lot of them start. Or I once did. 
And hearing Noah Baum talk about the books she loved as a child took me right back there to the floor of the bookmobile. That's where Noah's story took me. Where did the story take you? And who will you take along? It's a pleasure to be with you today on The Appleseed, and it's time now for a different kind of story about secrets, a story in which lives are on the line. A World War II story from the historical storyteller Pippa White. Pippa visited our studio from her home in Lincoln, Nebraska, and shared with our studio audience a story called, What Did You Do in the War, Mommy? Here's Pippa. And thank, uh, thank you to all of you. This story is new to my repertoire, and I've given you some history from quite a ways back. This goes back to World War II, but it's extraordinary in that it, re it really comes all the way to the present. It is Julia Parsons' story, and I'm going to let her tell it. I'll put the hat on in a minute. On December 7th, 1941, I was driving down Ardmore Boulevard in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, with the plan of delivering a birthday present to a friend. When the news came on the radio, the car radio, and said that Pearl Harbor had been bombed. And I remember thinking, where the heck is Pearl Harbor? <laughs> I had just graduated from Carnegie Tech, and I had never heard of Pearl Harbor. But believe me, there were millions of other Americans just like me. Little did we know how completely that day was going to change our lives. Didn't take long before I decided I wanted to do something for the war effort, so I got a job at an Army Ordnance Laboratory reading gauges. <laughs> it wasn't very stimulating work, it was very repetitive, I was glad to be doing something, but a few months later I saw in the paper that the Navy was looking for college graduate women for their Naval Reserve program. Uh, waves, women accepted for volunteer emergency services. <laughs> This appealed to me, so I applied, I was accepted, and off I went to Sniff, <laughs> Smith College, where I had a three-month course studying ships, naval history, uh, physics, teletype training. I even got a couple of classes in cryptology. This was so stimulating. In high school and college, I had loved physics, math, science. Matter of fact, I had wanted to be an engineer but back then, when a woman said she wanted to be an engineer, it was greeted with much laughter. <laughs> lots and lots of laughter. Anyway, it was a wonderful, stimulating course. As it was winding down, a man came into our classroom one day and asked if anyone there spoke German. I raised my hand, said I had a couple of years in high school. That was it. They whisked me off to the German section, and I had no idea what was in store for me. What was in store for me was an assignment in Washington, D.C., doing code work, top secret code work, tracking, transcribing, and attempting to solve coded messages sent to and from German submarines. At that time, the Germans were using something called the Enigma machine to encrypt their messages, and Allied forces could not decipher them. Those submarines, though, were sinking convoys of Allied ships, dozens and dozens of our ships. They traveled in packs, and they all had Enigma machines on board, and they all got the same messages. If we could figure out where they were, we would be able to steer Allied ships away from them. Those Allied ships were carrying much-needed supplies from North America to Europe to England, so it was very important work we were doing, and very difficult work because we had a new code to break every single day. We were not working on one code. We got a new code to break every single day. Incidentally, we were working with the first new computers, great big things they called bombs. I was on duty once for a very exciting breakthrough. We had had a very difficult week. 
we hadn't been able to break any of the codes and we were getting very discouraged. So we made a big spreadsheet of all those messages and we noticed that someone somewhere had been a little careless. The Germans always included a weather report in these messages, and that makes sense. Sailors need to know the weather, right? But someone somewhere had failed to change the wording of the weather report. It was the same wording every day. The weather in the Bay of Biscay on Monday will be. The weather in the Bay of Biscay on Tuesday will be. The weather in the Bay, and so on and so on. As soon as we realized that, We'd broken the traffic. We still had a new code to break every single day, but knowing that the wording for the weather report was going to be the same, we'd found a way in. Not all the messages were important. We got dummy messages. There were messages with personal greetings, such as happy birthday. Oh, I remember once a skipper, a German skipper, got a message congratulating him on the birth of his first child, a, a boy. It wasn't a week later, but that sub was sunk. And I remember feeling so bad about that. I mean, I know it was war. War is war, but it changed for me. It was no longer just sinking an enemy sub. This work was top secret. We could tell no one. We were instructed, you tell no one, not your parents, not other people working in your section. I roomed with a girl who was doing the same work for uh, Japanese codes. We never talked about it. I met my husband during the war. <laughs> he never knew what I was doing. So, my friends, Oh, and it would have been nice to brag, by the way. We knew what we were doing was very important, and we never got to brag. Anyway, it was 52 years. I was 77 when I finally got to tell people what I had done for the war. A friend of mine, an old Waves friend, uh, lived in Maryland and called me down to visit, told me there was a new museum on the grounds of old Fort Meade. Did I want to go? I said yes. We went in there and the museum was full of Enigma machines, all sorts of Enigma machines. So we said, this is top secret. How can this be? What, the, what are they doing? So we talked to a docent, found out that that had been declassified 30 years earlier. <laughs> in the 1960s, and no one had bothered to tell us. So, after 52 years and at the age of 77, I was finally able to tell my family, my friends, my extended family, my neighbors, what I had done for the war effort. My kids were impressed and intrigued, but I think mostly I was still just mom. <laughs> My husband was annoyed. <laughs> but they had told us, you tell no one. It had been drummed into us. I am now 100 years old. Julia is 100 years old and living in Pittsburgh and getting all the attentions she so richly deserves. For, for, for that 100-year birthday, uh, they gave her a parade in, in Pittsburgh, and uh, she even got a beautiful letter from Chief of Staff General Milley, Mark Milley, and his mother, too, was a wave in World War II. So um, I just wanted to share Julia's extraordinary story, and uh, she's still with us, and she said that the code work they did shortened the war by two to three years. And uh, she's proud to have been part of that. Pippa White with What Did You Do in the War, Mommy? We hope you enjoyed our top secret episode as much as we did. We want to thank Noah Baum and Pippa White for their stories. They made me wonder about the secret stories around me. What acts have I benefited from but never knew about? What journeys have been braved alone? We hope you don't keep your stories a secret. After all, sharing and listening to great stories can change your family's world. The Apple Seed is produced by Wendy Folsom, Sam Payne, and Brian Tanner. Our audio engineers are Ashton Parkinson and Carly Wilson. 
The rest of the Appleseed team is Kelly Wehrmeister, Trent Horton, Evadane Hendricks, Miriam Isay, and Tristan Schetzel. A special thanks to the subscribers of our podcast who rate us or leave reviews. You help people find the show. We also love to receive emails at the appleseed at byu.edu. Your thoughts and comments help us to shape the future of the Appleseed. We're pleased and proud to be among the many podcasts produced by the BYU Radio family. And you can find episodes of The Appleseed wherever podcasts are found, on the BYU Radio app or at byuradio.org slash appleseed. I'm Sam Payne, and the whole team can't wait to be with you again on The Appleseed.